try to be as brief as I can be um, and save some time for questions at the end in case anyone has any. Um, oh, sure. I should also apologize. I've got a cold, so um, my voice is going to be a little rougher than it normally is, and I might break into a paroxysm of coughing any minute, so <laughs> please bear with me. Okay. Um, today I want to talk about assessment literacy, and I'd like to thank Eric and Atta uh, for their presentations earlier because I think they really helped to set up my presentation, and I hope that my presentation will help to reinforce uh, some of their more important points. Okay. So, um, the title of this session is Assessment Literacy, the most important skills you may be lacking. Um, I apologize in advance if anyone expected that this session is going to give you everything you need to know to be assessment literate. It is absolutely not. <laughs> um, but I hope it will offer you something worthwhile. Um, you know, this point has come up a couple of times this morning, and I'm just curious about the members of the audience. How many of you took an assessment or testing course as part of your uh, graduate work or teacher training? Yeah, not too many. Um, it was part of, in a course, yeah, it was in its own course, and this is actually pretty common. Um, it's only recently that uh, the program that I graduated from at AUC uh, started requiring an assessment course. I took it as an elective, um, and I'm glad I did because it really helped determine my career path, which um, if you don't know me already, I'm a language assessment specialist. I work at the American University in Cairo, and before that, um, I worked for a major testing corporation, uh, which publishes the TOEFL. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> People aren't always happy to hear that. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Um, I really, really like this quote a lot. Um, <laughs> it means a lot to me because I've been both an instructor and a language tester, and I know how important it is that testing not be in the hands of testers. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you're going to see that throughout this presentation, I'm going to talk about testing a lot. I know the theme today is about assessment, but testing is a fact of life. It's never going away, at least not in the foreseeable future. So, part of our jobs as language educators is to be educated about testing. Um, I also really like this quote a lot too by Ilana Shohami. Um, why test? Who benefits? Who loses? And Eric spoke a little bit this morning about assessment purposes. Any assessment should have a clear purpose. Why else would you be giving it? Um, but we also need to be responsible and consider what are the consequences of any test or any assessment? Who benefits from it? We also have to think about who doesn't benefit, who might be harmed, who might be damaged by tests that are used for the wrong purpose, tests that are poorly constructed. Okay, uh, as Eric mentioned earlier, testing, it's just one part of assessment. And any kind of assessment, even if it's informal, making evaluative judgments, it can have positive consequences, it can have negative consequences, and oftentimes it has both, but you need to ensure that the positive outweigh the negative. Um, and 
Yeah, the consequences aren't just for students, they're for us as educators, for administrators, for school systems, even for entire countries. Okay, you know all of this, assessment, what is it? Someone mentioned earlier, I was glad to hear this, it's a process, okay? Sometimes it's an act. Um, and what we don't have time to get into too much today is assessment of learning. That's what testing does, right? We want to know, have students learned? Have they achieved the learning outcomes? But assessment for learning, the kind of assessment that we do in our classrooms, this is really powerful. It can make instruction more effective. And the whole point of instruction, right, is learning. OK, and assessment, if we can look at it as an integral part of instruction, not something that's separate, and of course, it's easy for us to see it as something separate because that's the way we've been taught to view it in teacher training programs, in uh, MA programs. The fact that students aren't required to take an assessment or testing course, this shows us the kind of importance people place on assessment, right? Um, and if done well, assessment can help inform instructional decisions. Do you need to uh, repeat a lesson? Do you need to try a new activity? Who's learning? Who hasn't learned? Okay, and the way that assessment supports and enhances learning is by providing feedback to students that is meaningful so they know what they need to do next. It provides important feedback to us as instructors so we know what we might need to modify. And this is really important, encouraging students to take ownership of their learning. Teachers and students should be partners in assessment um, and in learning as well, right? <laughs> Teachers can only do so much. At some point, the students have to take over and do what they're supposed to do. Assessment is something that teachers and learners do. It shouldn't be something that's done to them like tests frequently are. And this is really important. The tests that we are accustomed to, and probably the tests that your students take at the end of the semester, the end of their programs, these are based on a psychometric model that is not valid for learning. The purpose of those kinds of tests is not the same as the purpose of the assessments that we want to use with our students. Okay, so I said I was going to talk about assessment literacy. I'm going to show you a few different definitions. Um, and I should say, some of these definitions have to do with assessment literacy in general. Some of them are specific to language assessment literacy, but they overlap quite a lot. And language assessment theory, <coughs> is based in part on theory that has to do with educational measurement in general. So, the possession of knowledge about the basic principles of sound assessment practice. So, terminology, you know a lot of these things, item, format, reliability, validity. Okay, use of assessment methodologies. Uh, and techniques, and I was really pleased to see that on the schedule for today there'll be a presentation about uh, classroom assessment techniques. Um, and familiarity with alternatives to traditional measurements of learning. Uh, Stiggins, who uh, I'm sure if you do any sort of exploration of assessment you're going to see his name. and. He says, assessment literate educators come to any assessment knowing what they are assessing, right? Whether it's 
listening comprehension, whether it's writing ability, um, the construct or the skills. Um, how bad, oh, why they are doing so? This is very important. Why do you want this information? How are you going to use it? How best to assess the achievement of interest, the learning outcome, the skill, how to generate sound samples of performance, what can go wrong, because really a lot can, if you have any experience, uh, if you give a writing prompt and you are shocked to see that the students did not respond the way you intended them to, right? And how to prevent those problems before they occur. And this is a nice one uh, by Meg Malone, who's with the Center for Applied Linguistics, who has done a lot with language uh, assessment literacy. Uh, it has to do with familiarity with measurement practices and the application of this knowledge. It's not enough just to know it, but to apply it and apply it responsibly. <laughs> okay. Um, Glenn Fulcher, who maintains a website that I'll show you the link to later on in the presentation, this is how he's broken down uh, language assessment literacy. So just like when you were um, studying to become a teacher, right? You got this sort of background, the historical, social, political, and philosophical frameworks of teaching, right? But you didn't get them for language assessment probably, right? Um, so these are the context, the principles. Um, the guidance for the practice, so things like fairness, uh, which Otto was talking about. Um, and then when there is education related to assessment, this is what is focused on, the knowledge, skills, and abilities, item writing, item critiquing, right? But Fulcher saying to be truly uh, assessment literate, you need all of this. Okay, now there are a lot of obstacles to uh, achieving assessment literacy. We talked about the coursework. Uh, teachers don't have time to learn about assessments. How many of you are sitting around with extra hours on your hands every day? You are? <laughs> I would like to be you. <laughs> um, and people often don't want to make time because they're not being supported in it. When your school system, when your supervisor, uh, your program that you're enrolled in is telling you this is not really important, why would you then invest time and effort in it? Okay, another obstacle. Teachers, they're kept out of the assessment process. How many of you get to determine how your students are assessed? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Not very many people are allowed to do that. Um, even in the program in which I work, um, most of a student's final grade is based on standardized assessments that are given throughout the semester. And if I'm a teacher and I say, you know what, I don't like this. I don't like this multiple choice test. Forget it. <laughs> okay. When they are in the assessment process, usually it's the dirty work. How many people get to do scoring? <laughs> right? Is that the best part of assessment? <laughs> no. <laughs> OK. Um, Linda Taylor makes a point about uh, the field of language testing and more broadly language assessment. <laughs> it's becoming increasingly specialized. Um, it's a pretty new field, actually, that grew in part out of educational measurement, um, but it was really the mid-20th century that it became its own field. And it's becoming increasingly specialized, and that makes teachers feel like they can't be a part of it, because when they are using uh, complex statistics, how many people understand that? 
Okay, uh, in Bar Lori says that a testing culture is philosophically at odds, at odds with a learning culture. And we could also say an assessment culture, which is what we want to be trying to create. Um, the assessment culture would be part of this learning culture. We want students to learn. We want to support their learning, not just measure it. Um, teachers have negative associations with testing, right? We saw that this morning, that <laughs> a lot of people think about, what, uh, stress, anxiety. Not very many people, to this day, can overcome these negative associations. And Stiggins, again, uh, he's saying, you know, it's not obvious what this connection is between good teaching and good assessment. Okay, uh, Atta, I think you said that teachers spend up to 40% of their time, but in 2007, Stiggins said it was one third. <laughs> uh, what? Yeah, I'm sure it is because Testing especially is so pervasive these days. Everywhere you look in the world, with the possible exception maybe of Finland, that is always held up as an example <laughs> of an assessment culture or a learning culture rather than testing culture. Um, but in Egypt, in the US, tests are imposed on students and school systems for accountability purposes and for purposes of comparison. And I don't know if that's ever going to go away, to be honest. But the purpose of that kind of test is very different from our purposes. Okay, so what are the consequences of people assessing without really knowing what they're doing? <coughs> yeah, you see a lot of bad assessments. And this is a reason why so many people think testing and assessment is bad because there are so many bad tests. People have had really negative experiences. And I'll just give you an example. This is not language testing related. But when I moved from one state in the US to another, I had to get a new driver's license for that state. And I thought, well, I've been driving for, you know, 15 years, so it won't be a problem. They didn't make me do the actual driving part, but I had to take a written test. And I thought, okay, I know all of this. I've been driving for a long time. I know how far back to be from the car in front of me. You know, I know what a yellow light means. Well, all of, not all of the questions. Out of 10 questions on the test, Six of them were about the penalties that would be incurred if I didn't <laughs> drive well. So if I was driving while drinking, if I was following too close to another car, if I was speeding. I didn't know I needed to know this to be a good driver, so I ended up failing my driving test, and I had to retake it. But I didn't know that this was the kind of information they would ask about. Because is that related to driving? No. Knowing what happens if you're not a good driver <laughs> does not mean the same thing as being a good driver. OK. But maybe this will uh, encourage you to be a good driver. <laughs> yes, I mean, I. Maybe that's why they do it. There's this underlying agenda. But for, what? Yes, hidden agenda. But for me, I thought it was enough to know how to drive safely, not what happens to me if I don't. I thought I don't need to know that because I'm a safe driver, right? <laughs> okay, but the consequences for our students, for example, how can they know what they need to do to improve, to learn, if they're not getting accurate information? Okay, Malone again. 
assessment can and should integrate with teaching, right? Integrate, it should not be separate like we so often have. Uh, forming a relationship in which the two inform and improve each other. This is the heart of assessment literacy. We want it to give us information, assessment to give us information, so we can be better instructors, so our students can be better learners. But the relationship can't develop when language teachers don't have adequate training. Okay, now, um, I know that sometimes people say, but you know, the statistics or there's too much to know, an educator does not need to know as much as a professional language tester. You just don't. There's no reason for that. It's nice if you do, but it doesn't make you a better teacher to know, uh, I don't know what, standard error of measurement, whatever. You don't need to know this, Kronbox Alpha, okay? This core here of assessment, this is for test makers, this is for researchers, this is for professional uh, language testers. Okay, out here in the outer ring, general public, uh, policy makers like administrators, people who are making decisions about what tests should be used, when, why, how, Okay, in between this though is where teachers should be. This is where you should be. You should know more <laughs> than the general public, right? But you don't need to know as much as professional language testers. Um, I don't know how well you can see this. Taylor put together um, these, I don't know, matrices? I don't know what you would call them. Just to give you an idea Okay, this one obviously is for who? I don't know, can you see this? Okay, the four represents uh, a high amount of knowledge. The zero represents obviously no knowledge. But you see, a professional language tester needs knowledge in all of these areas. Do they always have it? I don't know. Um, but you'll see here in profile B, Right? Teachers do need to know about language pedagogy. That's our jobs, right? <laughs> but we don't need to know nearly as much about, uh, let's see, principles and concepts, right? You can leave a lot of that to the language testers, but you need some knowledge of it. Um, let's see, this is the profile for university administ. I don't know why university administrators and not just educational administrators. <coughs> um, but you can see how these profiles are very, very different. Okay, uh, the University of North Carolina has uh, the assessment skills that teachers need. How to define clear learning goals. How many of you know how to do this? Yes, everyone here, as a teacher, I know that you know how to define clear learning goals. Do you make use of a variety of assessments in your class? Yes, absolutely. How to analyze achievement data? But if you have made up some sort of assessment for your class, right, and you have the results, do you know what they mean? Yeah. How to provide appropriate feedback. Do you know how to do that? <coughs> how to make instructional modifications based on assessment results. I know that lots of people know how to do that. How to involve students in the assessment process. This is a little more difficult. How to create an effective classroom assessment environment that boosts student motivation to learn? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not all the time. But 
I hope that right now you feel like you have some of the most important basics of assessment literacy. Now, what Eric was saying earlier about how teachers are constantly doing assessment, right? But it's the making that unconscious uh, evaluation or judgment, making it more conscious and understanding what are the criteria that need to be applied. Okay, why do teachers need to be involved in assessment? It's nice not to be sometimes, and I'll <laughs> say that myself. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but you can't have effective assessment if teachers are not involved. They're the ones who know what's going on in the classroom, right? So someone who says, look, take this test, it's very reliable, and you know, these researchers spent all this time creating it and it's wonderful. How do you know if it matches up to what goes on in your classroom, what your students are learning? Okay. I'm sorry, I don't have the dates for this presentation. Christine Coombe, uh, who many of you may be familiar with, she's a past TESOL president. Um, and did she speak at Niall TESOL last year? Yeah. She used to have a website where she had tons of presentations that she'd done all over the world, and it's no longer active. I don't know what happened to it. Um, but in a presentation she did on assessment literacy, she said, involvement and assessment is every teacher's responsibility. <coughs> and educational reform will not be productive until teachers master the basic principles of sound assessment. This is really important. In order for assessment to be something that teachers and students do together in partnership, where the benefits outweigh the harms. Teachers need to be educated about assessment so they can educate the decision makers. And if you're not educated and you say, well, I just think this test is bad, is anyone going to listen to you? <laughs> right, but if you can say, the skills that this test is measuring don't match up with the learning outcomes of our course, they're not aligned, people are going to take you more seriously. <coughs> okay, uh, Shohami says the knowledge of any tester is incomplete, right? Because the tester doesn't know about your local context, whether it's your classroom, your school, your country. Okay, and the additional knowledge sources she's talking about are the stakeholders, including students, parents, and teachers. Uh, Alderson says that tests that are remote from teachers and learners are more likely to have a negative impact than those that involve them, right? That makes sense. Okay. And assessment literate teachers will typically make better decisions. Of course they will. If you know what you're assessing and why you're assessing it, and you can interpret the results accurately and correctly, then you can make better decisions. Okay, this is about why would teachers want <laughs> to be involved in assessment, because it's not a very glamorous job, I will tell you. <laughs> um, but I've seen, um, working with Atta on this assessment literacy training project, I've seen it working with colleagues both here at AUC and in my old job in the States, um, that people really feel like when they know more about assessment, it makes them better teachers. Um, and these are some quotes from some of my colleagues. Um, I've been trained well and I'm using the skills I learned not only for creating tests, but also in my teaching and for preparing classroom material. Um, let's see. This teacher said, I feel that our students are and will continue to be the true beneficiaries of this. 
Okay, uh, I hope that the rest of our colleagues get the chance to benefit the way we did since all teachers at one time or another prepare tests. And I would really like to substitute tests for assessments, right? Because this is part of our jobs most of the time. Whether they're the formal tests that come at the end of the semester or assessments during the semester. Okay. It was an eye-opener to be shown the flaws of what I thought was a good test. And this is what makes tests so dangerous, is that they are so powerful. And people invest this trust in tests that often they don't deserve. Um, speaking of TOEFL, I spent a Thanksgiving one year with my husband visiting friends in Istanbul. And our friends, uh, one of them had a colleague uh, he'd invited to dinner. And she asked what I did. And uh, I was very excited about my job. And I said, oh, I work for ETS, and I work on TOEFL. She said, TOEFL, that's the worst test in the world. And I said, oh, gosh, why, why do you think that? And she said, it's not a valid test at all. I said, oh, why do you think that? She said, I have all these students who you know, got high scores on the TOEFL, and they can't speak English at all. I said, but there's no, this was at the time when there was the computer-based test and there was no speaking. And I said, but. <laughs> It doesn't test speaking. It tests <coughs> reading and vocabulary. It tests, uh, yeah, written ex structure and written expression, right? And listening. No speaking. So how do you imagine that a test that doesn't test something is going to give you information about that, right? OK. OK, why we need to be assessment literate? To advocate for our students, right? To be the best that we can be as instructors, but also to uh, not let testing or dangerous forms of assessment be imposed on our students. We can't let those tests be seen as more important than the instruction that we're giving our students in the classroom. That's what makes the difference. OK. Uh, we have to understand the entire assessment process, right? From the purpose, why test? to the reporting, what information am I getting, how is it going to be used, the interpretation of the results. And it's not that testing, as Alderson said, is too important to be left in the hands of testers, but that teaching uh, and assessment can't be separate. They shouldn't be separate. What else? OK. So here. You want to know more about assessment? I told you <laughs> I wasn't going to give you the knowledge that you need, but I'm going to tell you where you can start if you want to know more, if you want to increase your assessment literacy. There's so much information in the world, really. <laughs> um, and I'll show you a few online resources in just a minute. I won't show them to you. I'll show you the links. Um, attending professional development sessions, just like today, right? Uh, conferences, the Niall TESOL conference, for example, always has several sessions related to assessment, and we are hoping to establish, as Atta said, a special interest group for testing, evaluation, and assessment. Okay, so it's not enough just to read and listen. But learn <laughs> from that. Practice. Try out some new things in your class that you've read about. So implement these. And then reflect. This is a really important piece of this, right? Was it effective? Did you get the information you were looking for? How did the students feel about it? Did they feel like they had a fair opportunity to demonstrate their skills? Well, 
reflect. No, reflect on what you might be doing differently or reflect on what you've learned. So maybe it's a reflection on your own learning about assessment, a reflection or evaluation of what you've tried that's new, that's different. Okay, the Center for Applied Linguistics has excellent resources for assessment literacy. And here's the website. Uh, Carla, which is the Center for Applied Research and Language Acquisition, they have excellent resources too. And Glenn Fulcher runs a language testing website um, where you can find lots of articles related to language testing and language assessment. Oh, sure, sure. And if you just Google these things too, you know, that's, you know, Cal, Center for Applied Linguistics and Assessment Literacy. Okay. Um, as I said, professional organizations like Niall TESOL, <laughs> we're hoping to have a special interest group. Um, colleagues are a good source of information too. You know, especially if you have people you like working with, you trust their judgment, and you know, you can work with them to develop assessments to use in your class. Find out what worked, what didn't. Yes. Ah, this is the International Language Testing Association. Um, you don't have to belong to it. I mean, it is primarily for language uh, testers, but um, they are, I think, <laughs> and they seem to be making more of a move to see how language testing can be applied to language education. Yeah. Okay, you can go to their website, and actually, one of the places they'll send you. <laughs> is this language testing info website, but it's a professional organization just like TESOL or Niall TESOL is. Um, and that's if you want to get to a higher level of understanding. And you know, there's a real need in the field of language testing and language assessment to understand the applications for language education. You know, there's been a real divide where people who are language testers, language assessors, don't know anything about education or instruction. <laughs> they just like language testing. Did you have a question? In, uh, in teaching uh, novel, uh, mm. for example, Oliver Twist or Gallimard uh, uh, Travels, uh, there is a question, a fine is a mistake. Mm -hmm. It took Oliver uh, nine days to arrive to London. Uh, yeah, you see, very bad, bad. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Let me say two our, things. Our and on memory, mm -hmm. and not, in, uh, not on skills. Okay. Two things here. Number one, a lot of this assessment that I'm talking about is what you're doing already in your class. You know, when Atta was talking about teaching to the test, we know that this can be a very bad thing to do because some of these tests are very, very bad. The other reason is that when students are applying skills for just one task only, they're not going to remember any of this. Right? They won't learn how to apply them to a new situation. So whatever skills or knowledge that you want students to come out of the class with has to be assessed in ways other than what the test, the formal test at the end assesses. You mean the formative assessment? 
Yes. Formative assessment because a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But you don't mean the final no, exam, because, exam. Right, because a lot of this is imposed on us. We don't have the ability to change the summative, the formative assessment. But we might have a chance eventually if we are educated about it and we can make a strong case for why this final exam doesn't uh, measure what the exam makers, the exam choosers, the exam users think it does, right? If we just say, you know, it's not a good test, it just relies on memory, okay, you know, you can say that, but you need to say more about it. You need to make the link between the learning outcomes, the instruction, and the assessment clear, because a lot of people who are imposing this on you, they don't know anything about assessment, but they know a lot about being accountable and about uh, what using the fewest resources possible to give a test, right? These are the things that they know about. And until they have some reason to do things differently, which is an angry, educated group of teachers, <laughs> they're not going to change. It's easy for people to say, the students do badly on this test because the teachers aren't doing their jobs, instead of saying, the students aren't doing well on this test because it's a bad test and we didn't know what we were doing when we selected it, right? What's the easier thing for someone to do? Blame yeah, blame the teachers, right? And we're going to keep getting blamed until we can make a strong case for why these imposed assessments are not pedagogically sound. Did someone else have a question? It's not a question, but uh, I want to comment on his question. Why do we test the students for remembering? I guess it's, it's not a plain. It's OK. As long as it is at the first level in Bloom's taxonomy, yes, I have test remembering. Why not? Right, so right. This is my comment. OK. Well, as Atta was saying, good tests are incredibly difficult to construct, especially tests that try to measure or evaluate higher level thinking, right? Yes, we can't remove remembering from our way of studying. No, of course not. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for example, Back to this doctor analogy, right? If you want to be a doctor, you have to study anatomy and physiology. You have to know all the names of all the bones in the body, right? You have to memorize that. It's not a higher level thinking skill. But if you forget that, as a doctor, you say, well, you know, there's something in her arm that's, uh, you know, one of those bones in her arm. No, <laughs> you have to say which one it is. But that's not the only thing doctors know. Uh, I, I am not against uh, measuring uh, memorization, but I'm again against this question in, no, in the novel. Uh, find the mistake. It measures the knowledge between lines. Yeah, listen, so I it's think. for the students. Mm -hmm. I can't see what you think of. Well, the okay, what happens if you ask, what do you think about? Who scores that according to what criteria, right? Isn't it just easier, faster, cheaper to ask questions that are based only on memorizing facts, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and if you don't have tests that reflect what you're teaching, then you have to try to do something about it. If you can't, okay, but does that mean that your students walk away from your class learning nothing? except how to memorize? No, you still will do activities in your class. You will still use assessments that reflect what you think is important, right? 
no matter what that test measures, right? So assessment literacy, it doesn't just need to be about, you know, these big standardized imposed tests. It's about what you're doing in your class every day to make sure that learning is occurring, that it's happening, and that students are getting something out of it. Okay, um, just back to here, local conferences and PD events. There are a lot of journals uh, for language teaching that are increasingly offering uh, articles about language assessment. And if you have access to this, the Cambridge University Press series of assessing reading, assessing listening, assessing grammar, assessing vocabulary, all of these, excellent. They're really accessible for non-language testing people. Okay, here are references, but I can send these to anyone who wants them. And will, will these presentations be posted somewhere? Okay. Okay, this is me, this is my email address. And, oh, you still need it? Okay. Okay, and as Waleed asked, this is about the uh, Disabled Access Friendly Campaign. I think you all uh, signed your names to receive more information. If you haven't, maybe it's in the back of the room. So, um, I've gone over time by about a minute and a half, um, but if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Okay, thanks.